An event seen from one point of view gives one impression. Seen from another point of view, it gives quite a different impression. But it's only when you get the whole picture you can fully understand what's going on. It's a great clip, isn't it? And I thought that in 29 seconds it tells more about the power of and importance of independent media that I could say in an hour. So I thought that it would be good to start with it. Uh, and also start with a little bit of statistics. According to relevant researches, 83% of the population of this planet lives in the societies without independent press. Think about that number. 83% of the population of the whole planet does not really know what is going on in their countries. Information that they get gets filtered for somebody who either twists that information or colors that information, does something with it. So they're deprived of understanding their reality. That is just to understand how big the import and, and important this problem is. Now, those of you who are lucky enough to, to live in those societies that represent 17%, I think should enjoy it until last. And on Sunday morning, you flip the paper, get your cappuccino, enjoy while it, while it lasts, because as we heard yesterday, uh, countries can lose stars from their, their flags, but they can also lose press freedom, as I guess Americans among us can tell us more about. But that's totally another and separate topic. So let me go back to my story. My story starts, the story I want to share starts in 1991. At that time, I was running B92, the only independent, for that matter, the only electronic media in the country. And I guess we were sharing, or we had that regular life of the only independent media in, in, in the country, uh, operating in hostile environment where government really wants to make your life miserable. And there are different ways. Yeah, it was a usual cocktail, a little bit of threats, a little bit of friendly advice, a little bit of financial police, a little bit of uh, tax control. So you always have somebody who never leaves your office. Uh, but what they really do, which is very powerful, and that is what governments in the late late 90s started doing, if they don't like independent media companies, you know, they threaten your advertisers. Once they threaten your advertisers, market forces are actually, you know, destroyed, and uh, advertisers do not want to come, uh, no matter how much does it make sense for them, do not want to come and advertise, and you have a problem making ends meet. At that time, at the beginning of 90s, we, uh, we had that problem, which was you know, survivable on one side. But what was really painful for me was, remember, beginning of the 90s, Yugoslavia is falling apart. We were sitting over there with a country in a downfall, in a slow motion downfall. And we all had all of that on tapes. We had the ability to understand what was going on. We were actually recording history. The problem was, that we had to retape that history a week later because we did not, we could not afford enough tapes to keep archives of, of that history. So, if I gave you that picture, I don't want to go too long on that. In that context, uh, a gentleman came to my office at that time. It was still 1991. He was running one media assistance organization, which is still in business. The gentleman is still in business. And you know, what did I know at that time about media assistance? I would think media assistance for organizations means they should help you. So I prepared two plans for that meeting, two strategic plans, the small one and the big one. Small one was, I just wanted him to help us get those damn tapes so we can keep that archive for the next 50 years. The big plan was to ask him for a $1 million loan, because I thought 
I still maintain that serious and independent media company is a great business, and I thought that B92 will survive and be a great company once Milosevic is gone, which turned out to be true. It's now probably either the biggest or the second biggest media company in the country. And I thought that the only thing that we needed at that time is $1 million loan to take us through those hard times. To make a long story short, a gentleman comes into the office, great suit and tie. Um, I, I gave him what I thought is a brilliant explanation of, of the political situation and explain how hard and difficult the war will be. Actually, I underestimated the atrocities, I have to admit. Anyway, after that whole big, long explanation, the only question he had for me, and this is not a joke, is are we paying royalties after we broadcast music of Michael Jackson? That was really the only question he had. He left, and I remember being, uh, being actually very angry at myself because I thought there must be an institution in the world that is providing loans to media companies. It's so obvious, straight in your face, and somebody must have thought of it. Somebody must have started something like that, and I thought I'm just dumb, and I cannot find it. You know, in my defense, there was no Google at that time. You could not just Google in 91. Um, so I thought that that's, that's actually my problem. Now, we go from here, fast forward to 1995. I have, I left the country. Um, I have a meeting with George Soros, trying for the third time to convince him that he should, his foundation should invest in something that should operate like a, a media bank. And basically what I was saying is very simple. You know, forget about charity, it doesn't work. Forget about handouts, $20,000 do not help anybody. What you should do is you should treat media companies as a business. It's a business anywhere. Media business or any other business, you know, it needs to be capitalized. And what these guys need actually is access to capital. So, third meeting, arguments are pretty well exercised. At the end of the meeting he says, look, it is not going to work. You will never see your money back, but my foundations will put $500,000 so you can test the idea see and see that it will not work. Um, he said, I'll give you a rope to hang yourself. <laughs> I knew two things after that meeting. First, under no circumstances I want to hang myself. And second, um, that I have no idea how, make it, how to make it work. See, at the level of a concept, it was a great concept, but it's one thing to have a concept. It's a totally separate thing to actually make it work. Um, so I had absolutely no idea how that could actually work. I had, had the wrong idea. I thought that we can be a bank. See, banks, I don't know if there are any bankers over here. I apologize in advance, but it's the best job in the world. You know, you find somebody who is respectable and has a lot of money. You give them more money. They repay you that over the time. You collect interest, do nothing in between. So I thought, why don't we get into that business? <laughs> So, here we are having our first client, brilliant, first independent newspaper in Slovakia. Government cutting them off from all the printing facilities in Bratislava. So, here's a daily newspaper that has to be printed 400 kilometers away from the capital. It's a daily newspaper with deadline of 4 p.m. That means that they have no sports, they have no latest news, circulation goes down. It's a kind of very nice, sophisticated way how to economically strangle a daily newspaper. They come to us with a request for a loan. They want to, the only way for them to survive is to get printing press. And we say, this, that's fine, let's meet, you will bring us your business plan, which eventually they did. We start the meeting, I get these two pieces of paper, not like this, A4 format, so it's much bigger. A lot of numbers there. A lot of numbers, but however you put it, you know, numbers do not make any sense. And that's the best they could do. Really the best that they could do. So that is how we understood what our method is. 
It's not a bank. We had to, we, we had to actually go into these companies and earn our return by fixing them, by establishing management systems, by providing all that knowledge, how do you run a business on one side, while they all know how to, run, how to create content. Um, just quickly on the results, over these 10 years, $40 million in affordable financing, average interest rate, 5 to 6%. Lately, we are going wild, charging 7% from time to time. Um, we do it in 17 countries of a developing world. And here is the most stunning number. Return rate, the one that Soros was so worried about, 97%. 97% of all the scheduled repayments came back to us on time. What do we typically finance? We finance anything that media company would need from printing presses to uh, transmitters. Uh, what is most important is um, we do it either in form of loans, equities, lease, whatever is appropriate for, for you know, supporting anybody. But what is most important here is who do we finance? We believe that in the last 10 years, companies that we financed are actually the best media companies in the developing world. That is the who is who list. And I could spend hours talking about them because uh, they're all kind of heroes and I can, but I, I'll give you just maybe one and depending on time, I might give you two examples, who do we work with? You see, we started working in Eastern and Central Europe, moved to Russia. Our first loan in Russia was in Chelyabinsk. I bet half of you had never heard for that place. Um, in the south of Russia, there's a guy called Boris Nikolaevich Kirshin, who is running an independent newspaper there. The city was closed until early 90s because, of all things, they were producing glass for Tupolev planes. Um, anyway, he's running an independent newspaper there. After two years working with us, he becomes the most respected newspaper in that small place. Um, governor comes to him one day, actually invites him to come to his office. He goes and sees the governor. The governor says, Boris Nikolaevich, I understand you're doing a great job and you are the most respected newspaper in, in our district. And um, I want to offer you a deal. Can you please give me your newspaper for next nine months? Because I have elections, there are elections coming up in nine months. I will not run, but it's very important for me who is going to succeed me. So give me the paper for nine months. I'll give it back to you. I have no interest in being in media business. How much would that cost? Boris Nikolaevich says it's not for sale. Governor says we will close you. Boris Nikolaevich says no, you cannot do it. Six months later, the newspaper was closed. Luckily, we had enough time to help Boris Nikolaevich take all the assets out of that company and bring it into, into a new one to get all the subscription lists, rehire staff. So what the governor got is an empty shell. But um, that is what happens if you're in business of independent media and if you are a banker for independent media. So, Sounds like a great story. Somewhere down the road, we opened a, a media management center. We started our media lab. Sounds like a real great story. But there is a sec second angle to that. The second angle, like in this clip. If you take camera above, you start thinking about these numbers again. $40 million over 10 years, spread over 17 countries. You know, not too much, is it? It's actually just drop in the sea. Because when you Think about the importance, some of the issues that we were talking about last night, this last session we had about Africa and these hypothetical $50 billion destined for Africa. All of those, not all, half of those problems mentioned last night, um, government ac accountability, uh, corruption, how do you fight corruption, giving voice to unheard, to poor, it's why media, independent media is in business. You know, it's why it was invented. So, from that perspective, what we did is just really one drop in the sea of that need that we can, we can identify. Now, ours is just one story. I'm sure that in, in this room there are like 15 other wonderful stories of nonprofits doing spectacular work. 
Here is where the problem is. And I'll explain to you as, as well as I can what the problem is, and it's called fundraising. Imagine that this third of this room is filled with people who represent different foundations. Imagine two thirds over here running excellent organizations uh, doing very important work. Now imagine that every second person over here is death, is not here, and switch the lights off. Now, that is how difficult it is to match people from this side of the room with people of that side of the room. So we thought that some kind of a big idea is needed to reform, to totally rethink fundraising. You know, instead of people running in this dark, trying to find their own match who will be willing to have the same goals, instead of all of that, we thought there is a, something new needs to be invented. And we came up with this idea of issuing bonds, press freedom bonds. If there are investors willing to finance U.S. government budget deficit, why wouldn't we find investors willing to finance press freedom deficit? Um, we've decided to do it this fall. We will issue them in probably nominations of $1,000. I don't want to advertise them too much. That's not the point. But the point is, if we ever survive to actually issue them, find enough investors so this can be considered a success. There's nothing stopping the next organization to start to issue bonds next spring, and those can be environmental bonds. And then uh, two weeks later, Iqbal Qadir can issue his electricity in Bangladesh bonds. And before you know it, any social cause can be actually financed in this way. Now we do daydreaming in 11.30 with 55 seconds left, but let's take the idea further. You do it, you start it in the States because it's you know, a concept very, very close to American minds, but you can actually bring it to Europe too. You can bring it to Asia. You can, once you have all of those different points, you can make it easy for investors. Put all of those bonds at one place and they sit down and click. Once you have more than 10 of them, you have to develop some kind of a metrics. What do investors get? On one side, financial, on the other side, social. So that brings the idea of some kind of, of, of rating agency, Morningstar type. Says, you know, social impact over here is spectacular, five stars. Financial, they give you 1%, only one star. Now, take it to the last step. Once you have all of that put together, there's not one reason why you couldn't actually have a marketplace for all of that. Why you cannot dispose of all of those bonds in a pretty quick way. And in that way, organize a financing so there are no dark rooms, no blind people running around to find each other. Thank you. <laughs>